Welcome back, biology, and today we're going to start chapter 14, which is on evolution. Uh, it's important to note that this is just the facts that science uh, kind of holds true about evolution, and uh, there's a lot that we're currently learning in this field of science, and it continues to change all the time. So, let's get right into it. All right, let's get started with some review just to get the gears turning here. Uh, when you think about evolution, when you hear about evolution, you probably think of a guy called Darwin. You've probably heard his name before. He's very, very um, pertinent in the field of evolutionary science. Uh, there's also lots of others. There's Pasteur, there's uh, Reddy, that we're going to talk about today. There's Lamarck. There's lots of different uh, scientists that have put forth some input on this topic. Uh, where does all life come from? When we talked about cell theory, we heard that cells come from cells come from cells from pre-existing cells. And then something we're going to talk a lot about in this in this uh, chapter are biomolecules. And remember that the four molecules of biomolecules are carbohydrates. Carbs, the fats like lipids. We have nucleic acids, DNA, RNA. And then we have our last one, which are the proteins, which are made up of amino acids. All right, let's move into some early belief. So, scientists originally believed life uh, originated and continued in a process called biogenesis. So, this, excuse me, biogenesis is what we currently believe. This is the principle that all living things come from other living things. At one point in time, that wasn't the popular belief of, of the world. And many scientists believed in a process called spontaneous generation, which is this idea or this process of living things coming from the perfect combination of non-living ingredients. Like if you had this rotting pile of meat here, it had all the perfect ingredients, heat and oxygen and uh, meat, and that would create flies. Like that was the belief that this kind of inorganic, this kind of non-living thing would then turn into uh, living organisms. So this was widely held belief, especially up until the, the middle of 1600s. Uh, this explained how maggots form on rotting meats. It explained why fish would appear on ponds that were dry the season before. Uh, people believe that the mud created things like fish and created things like frogs and created things like turtles. Those all spawned out of the mud, crawled up out of there, and then uh, began be bopping around on land. So the first uh, of our scientists here who we're going to talk about is Francesco Reddy. He was studying the development of flies, and he was kind of trying to figure out how their life cycle worked. He noticed that these little guys, the larvae here, would form these little tiny cases, these sturdy oval cases here called pupae. And eventually, out of that pupae, adult flies will emerge. What people of the time couldn't see and what was making, what was causing such a uh, idea of the spontaneous generation is we couldn't see the eggs of these flies. They're microscopic, so there you can't see them with a human eye. So we would see a fly, it would land on something, and then eventually there would be a larvae there and a pupae, and then another adult. So in, Re in his, Reddy had an experiment to kind of disprove this kind of idea that up until this point in time, people thought, that rotting meat created flies, that they were born of this of this meat, not of other flies. And in 1668, Reddy conducted an experiment to test this. What he did is he took two slabs of meat, and he put one in an unsealed jar with the, the top open, and one in a sealed jar with the top closed. In several days, he had these kind of maggots growing on the unsealed ones, but didn't have them growing on the sealed ones. So he's kind of trying to prove that without access to this thing, there was no uh, 
no abilities to make flies. What people said was, well, you need the air in there, so corking the air out uh, makes it so that the flies can't can't grow in there. Our next guy, Larazzo Spallanzani here. I actually share a birthday with him. Uh, fun fact. At the same time that Reddy was running his experiments, uh, microscopes were starting to come out and be in use, and individuals at the time were uh, had a similar idea with microorganisms. They believed in the spontaneous generation, but they thought that there was a vital force in the air that created microorganisms, that this kind of force had the ability to create and manifest uh, bacteria and stuff like that. So in the mid-1700s, Lorazzo here uh, set out to dispel that experiment and to prove that that wasn't the case. So he knew that microorganisms grew in food, so he took clear beef broth and he boiled it, and then he kind of did the same thing that Reddy did. In one flask, the control, he left it open to the elements, and in the other, the experimental, he sealed this flask. What happened in Spallanzani's experiments and the results from this are we had uh, the flasks that were left open, became cloudy after several days. That, was, that cloudiness was from the microorganisms that were growing in it. The flask that was sealed uh, stays clear until it was contaminated from air. The opponents of Spallanzani and the opposition claimed that he destroyed the vital force of the air by heating it. Essentially, he killed uh, the force that was able to create these microorganisms by heating it. What had happened is he had killed the bacteria and they were no longer able to grow, but his opponents weren't uh, able to see that yet with microsco microscopy, and so they didn't quite believe him. Our next scientist is, goes by, is Louis Pasteur, and we're now a couple, you know, we're almost into the, we're in the 1800s now. Uh, there's still this large controversy over spontaneous generation. And the Paris Academy of Science, which is depicted here in this kind of, uh, painting offered a prize to anyone who could clear the issue who could uh, say without a doubt either spontaneous generation is the, is the way that organisms are created or if it's not the winner of this uh of this kind of challenge spoilers is louis pasteur he creates an experiment to you know dispel this spontaneous generation idea and his experiment is, is pretty ingenious he invented this kind of flask here that has a curved neck to it. What this did is it kept, there was like a straw. It allowed air to come into and out of the flask. But the curve in it prevented solid particles like bacteria and uh, other kinds of solid matter to get into the flask um, after it was boiled. So he'd take these, he would boil them, and then see if any organisms would uh, show up results from his experiments uh, when the broth inside these flasks were boiled they remain clear up to a whole year and even some of them they still have some of his flasks in uh, the natural museum of paris there and they're still clear but what was really cool is when you broke that curved part uh, the broth became cloudy in a day and this kind of erased that controversy over spontaneous generation everyone kind of started to accept after this that organisms had to come from other living organisms. So in his uh, experiment here, he took these this broth, he boiled it. As it cooled, uh, there was dust in here with bacteria, but this solid particles couldn't make it up and then drop into the kind of liquid here. So days would go by, this would remain sterile, and then when he wanted to uh, prove that he could now get it to be cloudy, he would take it, tilt it, get those bacteria back into there, and then it would become cloudy, and you could see that there was now bacteria in there. All right, uh, before we get into talking about organisms, we need to talk about Earth as a whole. And once again, this is uh, all kind of facts that we've seen uh, due to a whole bunch of data about Big Bang Theory, about uh, how the universe works, what we're seeing today. Uh, so this is our best guess on the history of Earth. So around five billion years ago, we think that Earth that the Earth and all the planets and Sun were something like this, big swirling ball of gas and dust. And over time, as this spun, this pulled together, formed the Sun, 
and then the remaining debris and the remaining gas eventually pulled together to form planets. So you guys are just leftover star parts. Uh, at the time of their formation, the young planets were very, very hot. They were molten. Uh, they were big, big balls of magma and lava. Not exactly a place where you would uh, want to live. Uh, so Earth's age itself is estimated to be about 4.5 billion years old. We've reached this conclusion using radiometric dating, which is taking materials and using their age and the rate of decay to estimate how old the Earth is. It's our best guess. We can't go back and see the Earth uh, 4.5 billion years ago, but we can definitely, we, there's lots of evidence to suggest that we have uh, parts of Earth that are that old. So we're going to talk about radiometric dating, but remember that all atoms of the same type have the same amount of protons. So carbon always has uh, six protons, no matter what, you know, but what can change are the neutrons. The amount of neutrons in something can change. So every atom of carbon has six protons, but it has three really options for neutrons. The most common of them are carbon-12 and carbon-14, and even carbon-14 is like one and a half percent of all carbon on the planet. So carbon-12 is by far the more common. Uh, but these are all isotopes. These are atoms of the same type that have a different number of neutrons. And if you wanted to figure out the mass number of something, you would take the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. That's what we're looking at when we call it carbon-12. That's the mass number. It's six protons plus six neutrons. Carbon-13, same amount of protons, 6p plus 7 now. And then for carbon-14, it's 6 plus 8. Each time you still have six protons, but what changes is the amount of neutrons. Uh, isotopes look different from each other. All of these kind of look different, just barely slightly. And because of that, they all have kind of different, a little bit tiny different properties. Some isotopes are what we call unstable. And so what happens is they undergo radioactive decay where they lose particles off of them. So radioactive decay is the nuclei release of particles or energy. Smaller ones will do just energy until the nuclei becomes stable. So we call anyone that does this kind of loss of particles a radioactive isotope. So on this one here, this uranium here is losing two neutrons, two protons, and stops becoming uranium. It's no longer uranium-238. It's now thorium. And then this here helium particle uh, is lost off of there. So normally we say you can't change atoms. That's under normal chemistry. When we get to nuclear chemistry and we get to this radioactive stuff, these atoms will change from one type to another. It's very cool. Uh, when studying radioactive isotopes, we measure a thing called half-life. And we're going to talk about it next. Half-life is the length of time it takes for one half of any sample of radioactive isotope to decay. So if we had originally, let's just say, 10 of C14. Sorry, my mouse is not working real well today. After so much time, we would now have five of C14. This would be one half-life here. Different isotopes take different times. Uh, they could be from the seconds range. Some of them decay very, very quickly, and some of them decay over billions of years, like uranium. For the example of carbon, uh, we all have living uh, we have carbon in us. We all have a known quantity of carbon, and we have so much carbon-14 in our bodies and cells. You continue to accumulate carbon-14 until you die. After you die, you stop accumulating carbon-14. So at that point in time, uh, your sample starts to decay. It starts to have that half-life decay. So this is how we can take like dinosaur bones and other like living specimens and plants and fossils and all of that thing and figure out how old they are. So the half-life of carbon-14 is 5,730 years. So that means that half of the sample of carbon in a, in a, in a sample will go away in this amount of time. Uh, so after that, we'll have half of it. After another 
5,730 years, that sample will again be cut in half. So we started with 10. We'll go down to 5. And then we'd go down to 2.5, 1.25, so on and so forth. It keeps going down. Uh, any kind of radioactive decay will look like this. Where we start with 100% of it, and then right around 5,700, we're now at 50 of that 100%. And then after another, we're down to 25, and then we're down to 12.5, then we're down to 6.75. And so on and so forth. Like they continue to just decay at this very uh, steady rate. So the Earth uh, is a lot older than carbon 14's decay rate. So we can't use carbon 14 to measure Earth's age. Instead, we use the much slower decaying element, uh, uranium 238. Using this, the oldest rocks and crystals that we've discovered on the planet are 4 billion years old. We think Earth is a little bit older, though, because we think it formed at the same time as our moon. And our moon's rocks clock in at about 4.5 billion years old. Now, the reason that they're not the same is the Earth has all this tectonic forces. It has volcanism. It has rain. It has water. It has all of these processes that are eroding uh, away old rock and replacing it with new rock. And so we can't find uh, brand, brand we can't find any old old rocks because at some point in time they've been replaced by new ones. Where the moon, which doesn't have those processes because it doesn't have an atmosphere and it doesn't have any active volcanoes, is a more stable entity. All right, the first organic compounds, because we have to, life has to have these organic compounds. So where did they come from? Well, we've had all of the elements uh, on Earth in the early time when the solar system was forming. We had uh, lots of meteorites and stuff bombarding the Earth, bringing elements to it. But since then, we've had all of those elements just kind of hanging out. Uh, the question we have then is when did these elements form into organic compounds? When did we start to get things that looked like organic compounds? And a hypothesis by Alexander Operin and John B.S. Haldane suggested that the early atmosphere was made of ammonia, hydrogen gas, methane, and water vapor. We think this is mostly uh, things that were from these kind of vents. We think that they were from volcanism. Lots and lots of volcanoes spewing at this time of Earth at these high temperatures around like hydrothermal vents or from lightning striking, we could have gotten some amino acids formed. As the Earth cooled, these amino acids would have condensed and fallen into lakes and seas and the energy uh, with from the sun and from lightning again could have fused these amino acids into proteins. Now, Operin and Haldane's uh, kind of hypothesis was great, but it was untested. So in 1953, which is just almost 70 years, it's 70 years ago, uh, as of record this recording, Stanley Miller and Harold Urey set up an experiment to test this hypothesis. They took the gases here, that water and that methane and that ammonia and that hydrogen gas, and they supplied electrical spark to simulate the uh, lightning. And what they were successful in is they were successful in taking these constituent gases and creating uh, amino acids, creating the molecule ATP, adenosine triphosphate, which life uses for uh, energy, and for creating nucleotides, things that would, could be turned into RNA and DNA. So now we have some molecules, but how did they get to be cell-like? Well, there was some um, researchers, Sidney Fox, uh, primary among them and others that did some research on the physical structures that could have led to cells. And what they found is organic compound structures like cells uh, spontaneously form. We get these things called microspheres up here, which are protein molecules that are shaped like a membrane. And then we get these things that look probably more like cells uh, called coercivates, where they're droplets that contain many lipids. And inside of these lipids, we have amino acids and sugars. And these aren't alive. These are just naturally forming phenomena. But we think that somewhere, uh, the nucleic acids and these structures kind of got together. And that's how life was created. So what did uh, early life look like? Well, the first life forms uh, kind of, you know, we're very interested in what they looked like. So 
when we talk about life forms, we need to know what molecules hold the genetic information for life. And these, those are the nucleic acids. DNA, RNA, nucleic acids. All life on the planet uses both RNA and DNA. So that's probably a good place to start there. Uh, why is RNA important and necessary? Because RNA is more versatile than DNA. DNA holds the code, but RNA can take it as a message. It can form a ribosome that can help create more amino acids and proteins, or it, RNA has the ability to be transfer-like uh, and take amino acids to, to the ribosome to build protein. So while DNA is good for storing information, RNA is really good at using information. So the roles of RNA in this kind of process. Uh, Thomas Scheck in the 1980s, so we're talking 40 years ago, uh, discovered RNA and unicellular or eukaryotes that can act as a chemical catalyst. Remember that unicellular eukaryotes are really simple ones. Uh, they still, they're still have uh, mitochondria, they still have ribosomes, they still have all of those organelles that we see in modern eukaryotes. But he called these RNA molecules ribozymes. They're like enzymes, but they're ribozymes. They do the same thing that enzymes do. They catalyze specific chemical reactions. So in this case here, uh, this one is making copies of itself, basically, over and over and over again. So ribozyme functions, they can act as catalysts for their own replication, and that's the important part here, their own replication. And we have uh, been able to create self-replicating RNA in the lab, just kind of by mixing together a whole bunch of different nucleic acids. What our kind of understanding of the ancient world is and our kind of hypothesis is, is that life could have started with this self-replicating RNA that was able to make more of itself. Uh, the model that RNA came first, we call it the RNA world model or the RNA world hypothesis. So RNA, uh, these early RNAs probably underwent competition. And what is competition? This is the uh, fight for any kind of resource. In this case, it's the fight for fight for nucleic acids. So these early strands of the self-replicating RNA probably competed with other RNA molecules for nucleic acids. Uh, the ones that best replicated and got to continue to scoop up these nucleic acids probably were the ones that got to pass on their code to the next generation. This happened over and over and over again. Uh, on the early Earth, it probably looked like this because there was no free oxygen. We didn't have water in the atmosphere either, so we probably had this kind of grayish, greenish, brownish planet at this point in time. Uh, the oldest fossils we found were uh, the size and shape of the of some living prokaryotes or bacteria-like or archaean-like uh, organisms. And it makes sense that the first cells were probably prokaryotes. They're probably the simpler ones. They were probably anaerobic, which means they didn't require oxygen. And some of them probably were heterotrophic, which means they ate other organisms. The very first of these probably used chemosynthesis. These here uh, above me are archaeans. They are unicellular organisms, which are very adapted to living under extremely harsh environmental conditions. We find them in the Dead Sea. We find them around uh, volcanic vents under the ocean. We find them in just all kinds of weird spots because they're able to survive super uh, strenuous, super weird, super like, harsh environments. Uh, chemosynthesis, this is energy obtained by using inorganic substances. These guys most of the time are methanogens, use things like sulfur. And then they'll use carbon dioxide as their carbon source. So they were taking sulfur for energy and taking carbon and fixing it into their cells uh, to actually create more and more cells here. Over time, uh, we've, these cells probably figured out, and some cells figured out photosynthesis. Cyanobacteria, these are the first organisms to use photosynthetic. Uh, they were photosynthetic unicellular prokaryotes. There are these guys here. You can see they've got all these little green going on here. 
Uh, the oldest known fossils are very similar to what we see on these organisms here. Oh, oxygen in the early, uh, in early organisms was very toxic. Uh, but it was also a byproduct of photosynthesis. Remember, when we make photosynthesis, we take carbon dioxide and water and light and turn it into uh, sugars and oxygen. So we created a lot of oxygen uh, as these guys started to use photosynthesis. So early organisms develop molecules to bind to oxygen and prevent its toxic effects, which is awesome because eventually those molecules would turn into like the hemoglobin that you guys use in your blood. All right, so oxygen buildup. After billions of years of photosynthesis with lots and lots of this oxygen waste, we have oxygen reaching the upper layer of the atmosphere, where these O2 molecules were bombarded with UV, bombarded by lightning, and split into radioactive O molecules that then bonded to another group of this O2, this free oxygen, this is the oxygen you breathe, to create ozone. And the cool thing about ozone is it, it absorbs harmful UV radiation and what this did is it made the land more inhabitable. So plants could start to go up there, but animals could start to go up there. Uh, the first eukaryotes. So there's two things that separate the eukaryotic cells from the prokaryotes, and they are having a nucleus, and then having membrane bound organelles and Lynn Margulis uh, she had this kind of hypothesis that early prokaryotes had a symbiotic relationship with other prokaryotes meaning they work together and we've already talked about this a little bit but this is the process of endosymbiosis uh, so on early earth a larger anaerobic prokaryote ate a smaller one this is what's happening here. Uh, we also believe that uh, at some point in time, there was an infolding of these cells as it kind of like went through uh, mitosis wrong. And this early kind of infolding of the cell created the nucleus. So the nucleus is also something that we think formed at this kind of time. So we got the nucleus first, and then this cell, which now has more genetic information, uh, ends up eating one of these smaller aerobic prokaryotes, ones that are using uh, oxygen to create energy. And this is how our modern mitochondria formed. Later in the evolutionary tree, we think that uh, this line kept going. This is how we got like us. We don't have any chloroplasts. We're not able to photosynthesize. So this guy kept going and became uh, heterotrophic, meaning eating other uh, cells. Uh, this is how we kind of created fung fungi also can't use photosynthesis so this is how they started but for plants uh, the chloroplasts got kind of ingested next and this would be cyanobacteria that turned into these chloroplasts they got uh, absorbed didn't get eaten started to produce uh, and make sugars for the cell and then the cell kept passing them on to its ancestors one after the other uh, this kind of theory explains why chloroplasts and mitochondria have their own DNA and why they replicate independently from the rest of the cell. They have their own replication cycle, kind of like mitosis, kind of like kind of like binary fission for these guys actually, but yeah, so this is how we got a mitochondria, this is how plants got chloroplasts. If you want to go and do some uh, additional research, look at secondary endosymbiosis and you'll see how like algae and some protists got their uh Chloroplast, it's very, very cool, very fascinating, very big steps the science we're taking. Uh, this is the end of chapter 14. I hope that you learned something. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if you have any questions, let me know, and we'll see you in the next one.